welcome to episode 66 of Glass Onion. I'm John Lennon, and this is a John Lennon deep dive with Spencer Cox. I'll get to that in a second, but I think it might be time for a bit of a guitar lesson. I haven't done that for a while, and I did think of something that might be useful, so here goes. So it's related to the bridge, what the Beatles used to call the middle eight. It's the part of the song that breaks up the pattern of verse and chorus, and sometimes you have a bridge and a guitar solo. Sometimes you just have a guitar solo, sometimes just a bridge. The Beatles used to call it the middle eight because it traditionally would be eight bars, but I think even when it wasn't eight bars, they'd still call it the middle eight, but, you know, that's the Beatles for you. I'm going to be using a number system, which is one to eight. So if you're in the key of C, C would be one, D would be two, E would be three, F would be four, et cetera, et cetera. If you remember the 12 Bar Blues episode, we were talking about the three chord trick, the one, four, five. So yeah, in the key of C, that would be C, F, and G. I always remember status quo were honoured for 25 years in the music business, and they said 25 years and three chords. For anyone who doesn't know what the key means, it's the home chord. So if we take a famous song, Imagine, for example, traditionally it's the chord that ends the song. So. And the world is one. So you're ending on C. Imagine itself actually starts on C as well. A lot of songs do, but you're supposed to know the key of the song by the chord that it ends on. Of course, that's been subverted over the years by various bands. Anyway, so one little trick that has been used a couple of times by the Beatles goes all the way back to 1958, in spite of all the danger. If you heard bonus episode 7 when I was on with the TCB guys, I actually sung a bit of this song. So you're in the key of E, so in spite of all the danger... In spite of all that may be, oh, I'll do anything for you, anything you want me to, you'll be true to me. So that's the key of E's, that's just E, A, B, that's a one, four, five. But when they get to the bridge, they do a uh, seventh. I'll look after you. So that's the four chord. So that's a pretty basic way to go to the bridge go from the one to the four and ten years later they essentially did the same thing with back in the USSR so you, go, you don't know how lucky you are boy back in the USSR and we're in the key of A there so a way to get from the one to the five would be so the Ukraine goes that's the four knock me out leave the west behind do the same thing again and then you can kind of come back again so back to the one again so that's one way you can do it I actually wrote a song with a friend of mine called Whistle Stop Cafe and there you're on, there you're on um, an E chord to go to a bridge on the A that seventh, just like in spite of all the danger, but it's this time instead of going up, it's so. Not surprisingly, a lot of my music is very influenced by the Beatles and uh, John Lennon and Bob Dylan as well. So, um, as I've said previously, you know, the magic of Beatles songs is just subverting, even just slightly, what would be the norm, you know, the, the trick that a songwriter would normally go to at a particular point in the song. So I'll just show you a few other Beatles songs and what they chose to do to go to the bridge. So, Hard Day's Nights are in G. Been like a dog. To the bridge they went to the three minor, which in the key of G would be B minor. When I'm home, everything seems to be right. And then we got We Can Work It Out. Also goes to the B minor, but this time it's the six minor because we're in the key of D, so. Try to see it my way. Do I have to keep on talking till I can go? We can work it out, we can work it out. Life is very short and there's no time. So nice chords there. 
And then we've got Lady Madonna, so we're in A. So again, it's a climb up, and the bridge is the four minor, so that's D minor. Tuesday afternoon is never ending. Wednesday morning papers didn't come on. And the left hand of the piano is doing some nice stuff. I think the bass is doing it as well. Just a couple more. I feel fine. Now again, we're in the realm of uh, genius or laziness. You decide. <laughs> but I feel fine. So we're in G. Baby's good to me, and all she's happy as can be. Oh, she said so. It's D seven. That's just three chords. And what he does for the bridge here. He just stays on the one, so he just does the one again. I'm so glad that she's my little girl. But he does a trick which some of you regular listeners might remember from Norwegian Wood, and I'll show you it here. So it's. I'm so glad she's my little girl. Now again, the easy thing would be to just repeat that. And that he's telling all the world, but it's. I'm so glad she's my little girl. G B minor C D. G B minor A minor seven D. So A minor seven instead of C. Very similar chords, almost the same notes, but just that subtle change. And on the subject of Norwegian wood, I'm gonna I'm gonna show you again how we did the same trick and what we did with Norwegian wood. So we're, so we're in D. I'm capo on the second, but let's call it D because I'm doing a D shape. bridge just stay on the one but make it into a minor and I think I did a lesson previously about major to minor changes yeah I did because we were talking about Besame Mucho does the opposite thing so key of D D minor thought I didn't and crawled up to sleep in the bath now instead of doing the G the second time D minor 7 so the same trick as I feel fine like I said and then you've got A7 one of the guitars even does that high A, which is quite nifty as well. Now that's a good songwriting trick. So let's say we're, you're composing a song in the key of D. Good thing when you change key for the bridge is to try and get back to the 5-7. So in D it would be A7 as I just said. And then that brings you nicely back to the 1 key. So okay, that's the guitar lesson for today. So today's episode is a talk with Spencer Cox, who is a journalist and a Glass Onion listener. And this is a fairly wide-ranging conversation, but it goes into some quite familiar glass onion topics, such as John Lennon, 1980. Surprise, surprise. Also psychology. We talk about drugs and society's attitude to drugs. And there's a few tangents, as there always are. But a pretty interesting conversation. So I'll let you get on with listening to that, and I'll be back on the other side with a few words. Enjoy. I've never interviewed an interviewer, and <laughs> so this is kind of... I'm just taking it as this is just a conversation. And, you know, I, from what I've gathered, I mean, from hearing your interviews, you and I have the identical same style of interviewing. And so it's just going to sound like a mirror pretty much. That's fine. So, I mean, can you maybe tell me a little bit about your, you know, your background and how, I mean, you kind of got started in this. I know you're an English teacher for a while in India. Is that correct? Or it was somewhere else? No, I was an English teacher in Laos and Thailand in Asia and then Italy and then Spain. And I still do it now, but it's all online, so I'm hearing yeah, it. Everything, everything's online. What, what grades do you teach? It's not grades as such. I teach adults. I used to teach kids, but it's uh, sometimes it's exam preparation, sometimes just conversation classes. Okay. Probably the youngest person I teach is 17 or 18, but basically adults. Sometimes you need exam certificates to, to go abroad, so it's a bit different now. But when I was in Spain, for example, there were a lot of people – that wanted to go and study in America or Australia or Dublin or England, UK, and they just needed a certain certificate. So I was preparing them for a specific exam. A lot of people now, they just want conversation. They just want to be able to converse in a confident way. 
I mean, as a journalist, I mean, I, I love the English language, so yeah, I, I love, understand that. I love language as well, yeah, I really do. And um, Beatles is <laughs> very ripe for that. I love all the puns and the wordplay. I'm probably going to do a show on John Lennon's books at some point. Uh, yeah, I've been starting to kind of read um, his first one in his own right, and it's, it's interesting. What's funny, though, is, you know, as, as a journalist and as someone that, you know, can usually read some pretty hardcore books, the only book I really gave up on, and I felt really dumb reading it, it's the latest, oh, it's the Ken Warmack, um book, his newest John Lennon book, John Lennon 1980. Mm-hmm. Have you read it yet? Yeah, yeah. He was on the show back in October, and I'm just editing it, funnily enough. I was editing it today. It's going to be the next show that comes out. He is so eloquent with his writing. It's so, the, the wording he used, I mean, there were a few words in there that I had to look up, which I felt dumb. I've never had to do that, but I, I was reading the Kindle version. I kept having to highlight it and define it, and it's, it's a very eloquent book. That's so funny you say that, because literally the last two hours before we connected today, I've been editing the talk with him, and it's, it hasn't taken much editing because he's very smooth when he speaks. But, yeah, he's using a lot of words, vicissitude and august and words like that. That's funny. Called my podcast August, which is nice. Yeah, it's a good book. It's a good book, though. Yeah, very detailed. Would you feel comfortable discussing Goldman's book, or you said you don't want to publicly talk about that because you don't want to? I mean, I've promote it to death on the show, so yeah, why not? Okay. <laughs> I'm actually rereading it because I'm going to be on a show. I don't know when this is actually going to be going out. What we're doing now, but I'm going to be on a show in March or April called Let It Roll. Really good podcast. And we're going to do a deep dive on that book. And I'm just rereading it. I'm about halfway through. So, yeah, shoot. We've kind of corresponded in an email about it. You know, with everything, you have to take it with a grain of salt. And whenever you read enough Beatles books, you can kind of cross-reference, which is actually really annoying because whenever you've read enough, you start becoming a snob about it. I've realized I do that. When they have the wrong date, it drives me crazy. <laughs> but uh, as a whole, how do you feel about the book? Well, I'm about halfway through reading it, so... I'm already finding from reading it that a lot of what I thought may not have been accurate or perhaps I just, I think we all have um, quite, I don't know, simplified opinions about things because there's so much out there that you can't possibly analyze everything to death. So most opinions that I think all of us express are quite generalized to some extent, but there's quite a few factual errors in it. And at this point, having done this podcast for two years or more, I don't really let emotion get in the way. Like I, I'm, I can look at it almost clinically. You know, I don't get offended when someone writes something bad about John Lennon. It's not that kind of relationship right. I have with my subject. But I think some of the writing is fantastic, and it's actually really funny as well. Yeah, he's an amazing writer. I mean, he really. I mean, uh, you know, take his character out of it, but he genuinely is a good writer. Yeah, I've learned a lot. I mean, we may as well be candid. You know, I had Caitlin was on the show. Yeah, I, I saw that. I heard it. And we've got a follow-up that will probably come out by the time this one comes out. So, Because she was only a kid, she keeps apologizing to me and saying, oh, God, I'm sorry I wasn't older when I could have given you better memories. And I said, oh, yeah, I blame your parents. I should have conceived you earlier. So we've been kind of joking about that. Right. But uh, she said, and this was on the show, I think, episode 56, Coleman or Goldman, Albert was basically a queen. And she met, she met it in the sense that she thought he was gay, even though he had a girlfriend. When she said a queen, she kind of meant like um, a little bit of a drama queen. And, I mean, she was uh-huh. just talking, you know, very directly. And she said, I mean, Goldman said that he, he was a Lennon fan, and then he, the more he read about him, the lower his opinion was. But Goldman had already done this book about Elvis, and a lot of Elvis fans. I, I've kind of found myself in the Elvis community because I did that three-parter with Ghosty, and then I just guessed right. it Elvis shows. And those guys, you know, they know their facts. And they say there's loads in the Goldman book that is just factually inaccurate. So I think with John Lennon, there's some amazing psychological insights. There's some great pieces of writing. And there's some hilarious stuff. But it's just a very negative representation. It's the kind of thing where you could take any facts and you can dress them up in a positive light or a negative light. And he just chose to put them in a negative light. And in one of his interviews, he said, if the book had been more positive, I would have made more money. And I don't quite get that because people love, you know, the public loves that kind of tabloidy dishing the dirt. Well, especially, I mean, you know, now you you can look things up online. Back then when it came out in 86, I think it was, there wasn't much out there. I think Coleman's book, I haven't read it at all. 
and I actually learned about it on your podcast, came out two or three years after. So there really wasn't much yeah, Coleman, information it, back then. Coleman was 84 and Goldman was 88. So yeah, that wasn't <clears> too much different, but obviously Goldman apparently took six years to write it, which uh, it could well be, you know, if you include all the research. So Goldman would have been researching it perhaps around the time Coleman's book came out. But the Ray Coleman book, I don't think you'd find huge surprises in it. It's a nice read. It's an easy read. And it's a good sort of startup kit, you know, for anyone who wants to get to John Lennon. That one in the Imagine film from 1988, that's your perfect start point. But then, you- Yeah, that, you know, funny enough, Imagine, that was my start point. Purchased it on iTunes around the time I was getting mm-hmm. into the Beatles. And that was my first Beatles documentary I watched. And then, of course, the anthology. With any of these books, though, I like them talking about John as a person. And that's one thing I love about Fred Seaman's book. You know, no person is going to be peace and love 24-7. Everyone has different aspects to their character. And that's what I enjoy about Goldman's book. You know, Seaman's book, I mean, he was only there 79 to 80 and, you know, until he died. So his book, from what I've seen so far, I haven't finished it yet, of course, but it's just a very reclusive John Lennon. He's in a bedroom, never leaves hardly. Yeah, I, I, again, I, I think, boringly enough, the truth is in the middle, <laughs> as it always is. Caitlin told me that John, I mean, she was only, I think she was nearly six when he died. She was about nine months older than Sean. She said he spent a lot of time in the bedroom or, or she'd hear like, oh, daddy's going to take a nap kind of thing. And he'd be in his room. But I think Goldman has just taken that idea and really taken it. John Lennon's room was his womb kind of thing. And one thing I have heard about his book, and I, I can't confirm this because I haven't gotten to this point, just whatever I'm on, mm. is that he has claimed that John was abusive towards Sean. I don't believe that for a second. I think Sean was the apple of John's eye. I think he might have had outbursts at him. Sean told a story online a few years ago that John was teaching him how to cut steak, and Sean was struggling with him. John screamed at him, and it burst at his eardrum. I mean, I could see a John's personality flipping out and, and doing that, but I mean, I've, I've read some things about Goldman's book where he accuses him of physically having an outburst at Sean, and I, I don't believe that for a second, I think. Well, sure. well, so Sean said that John burst his eardrum. Yeah, this was an interview years ago, um, oh, but he said pretty- that, you know, well, that's coming. Yeah, he said that he had only seen his dad cry once, and that was when a cat jumped out a window in the Dakota and died. John cried there. And then Sean said the only outburst John had was he was trying to teach him to cut steak. And Sean was a four-year-old having problems with it, and John screamed at him. But, you know, with Goldman's book, I'm definitely going to be taking a lot with grains of salt when it comes to Sean because, not to get all personal, but my dad was – not abusive, but maybe emotionally abusive to his first kids in his 20s. And then I came around, he was 42. And I got a completely different dad than than they got. And so for myself, I can have a personal experience with that. I understand when people have a kid at a later age, it's usually a lot different than the first kid. And so I, you know, I definitely think, you know, Sean was the apple of John's eye and that I just can't see him treating him poorly, honestly. Well, Caitlin said something interesting one of the things that Goldman's book was of John biting Sean and Caitlin said that actually did happen. However, she said basically Sean bit Caitlin, who was his playmate. And then John bit Sean. And I was trying to say to Caitlin, was it done like in a nasty way, in a jokey way? And she said it was something in the middle. So again, I think the John Lennon that emerges is always in the middle of the two extremes. Parents were different though back then. And that, that's not an excuse, but I could yeah. see him going, okay, well, how do you feel if someone does that to you? That, and- that was exactly what it was. Yeah. He, he bit him, not like really hard. He didn't like take a chunk out of his hand or right. thing like that, but he just did it to demonstrate. I don't know how you describe it. Almost like um, naturalistic parenting. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it's, and, you know that's, that's a bad thing about celebrities is that, you know, no parent is perfect. Parents do some stupid things sometimes. Mm. And whenever it's your kid, I mean, I don't have kids, obviously. When you're at home with them, things are much different at home than they are in public. You know, you're not always going to be having the public attitude, if that makes sense. Yeah, it was a kind of... I can't see it being a malicious thing. (laughs) No, it was more of a kind of, um, oh, this is what it feels like, almost like a like an educational thing, let's say. I don't know. But That's interesting, though. It's a lot of it you have to take with a grain of salt. It's like I said about cross-referencing it books. Like whenever you read enough, you start hearing the same stories multiple times. Cynthia said in her book that Fred was giving Julian driving lessons. 
Mm. And John started screaming at Julian and made a huge scene and everything. Well, you have to think about it. I mean, it's his ex-wife. Your ex-wife is going to be talking about you in a different light than another person would. And then in Fred's book, he says that uh, Fred said he was just going to let Julian drive around in the driveway. And John screamed at him saying, why would you let a 16-year-old drive a $30,000 car? Mm. And it's like, okay, that's more realistic than going for a drive and John's berating and getting in Julian's face screaming, you know? Mm. And so... You kind of have to take a lot of that with a grain of salt, which, I mean, you know, I mean, as, as you've been doing this for so long. Yeah. Well, Julian said some very interesting things over the years. First of all, Julian has said that he very rarely, if ever, laughs anymore, which is very sad because he had a laugh when he was a kid that was a really annoying laugh. And John, then John say, I hate your fucking laugh or something. So, is that? I mean, again, we don't know whether, you know, I don't know whether he said right. exactly, but you get the point. You know, he, I think John Lennon had this kind of, he was a sort of a, you know, the the scary dad. I mean, we've seen that in lots of movies and stuff. It's been actually being fairly well represented. Yeah, that scary dad, you know, who can who can really cut you down. And I think John Lennon did that to adults as well as as children. And Julian said something very weird. He was staying at Tittenhurst, you know, the big house in Ascot, and everyone's seen the Imagine video, I guess. And Julian said they he couldn't understand why they did this, but John and Yoko put him in a room that was like miles away from there. It was like over the other side of the house. And I don't know how many rooms there were at Tittenhurst, but I mean, Kenwood had something like 25 rooms, so Tittenhurst may have had 30 or 40. And Julian was scared in the night, and he went into John's room, and they they basically kind of shooed him out of there. He said, oh, you know, go back to your room kind of thing. So I think he was a terrible parent first time round, but I think we should all we should all learn to forgive someone, particularly if they try and mend their ways. And I think John Lennon was very childlike himself, You've seen this a few times with rock musicians. They get to a certain age, but they're still kind of like teenagers, like, I don't know, someone like, I don't know, Ronnie Wood from the Rolling Stones or something. I've been reading about him, and he still sort of gets to behave like a teenager, basically, even though he's whatever he is now, 60, 70. So I think there's an aspect to the overgrown teenager about John, and I think he was protected. In the Dakota, he was sort of protected by Yoko basically being his business manager as well as his wife. I always think of him as being, like, quite cocooned, you know, and, and I, I could see that. Yeah, and Goldman again has taken this further. That, like I said earlier, his room was like his womb. You know, and there was like a red light or a blue light or something in John Lennon's room, and it was a source of comfort when he woke up in the morning or something. But he just takes it very far and takes the the most negative representation and takes the extreme. So you feel like there's some kind of agenda going on. I can see that as mm. well. You know. A lot of it, like I said, you just have to cross-reference heavily. Of course, Beatle fans will understand, you know, this is a passion, and it's fine cross-referencing it. But, you know, the average person obviously won't be doing this. But there's a there's a book I read a few years ago, The John Lennon Letters. Have, have you read that? Oh, yeah, The Hunter Davis. Oh, it's brilliant, yeah. And I, and I think that was great because it, it has, you know, a lot of his letters. I mean, it has a lot of the things he wrote in it. Mm. And, you know, whenever I listen to Cynthia's book, I listen to that first. That was my first Beatles book I ever read. And so that was my foundation for a lot of things. And it's obviously become shaky mm. over the years as I've learned more. But there's a part in the book where uh, John wrote a letter to Cynthia saying, you know, you tried sleeping with me that night and, you know, wherever it was while he was with May. And Cynthia had come to see him with uh, Julian. And, of course, Cynthia doesn't mention that in her book. And so that's the problem is you have you need to look at who the person is. I mean, I'm sure if you had an ex-girlfriend writing your biography, it probably wouldn't come out the best, and neither would mine. Yeah, sure. Um, and so there's, you know, there's some truths there, but it's just you got to take a lot of that stuff with a grain of salt. And that's what I think the great thing about your podcast is, is that you have educated people on there, and you're educated as well, mm. and you're able to filter it out. You know the old saying, like, the more you, uh, I don't know, I'm going to completely butcher it, but uh, one Zen master or another, so, you know, the, the more you find out, the less you know, you know, something like that. And I think really if if you're a true scholar of uh, someone that you've never met who's just like a famous name that existed years before you were born or in my case, you know, John Lennon died when I was five years old. I think that the best thing you could do is to say, well, I'm never going to find the truth. So I'm just going to have a lot of fun trying to find it and finding little kernels of truth. And I mean, the John Lennon Letters is a great book because you can see it's John Lennon. That's clearly his handwriting. 
you know, and I don't know whether and he was a horrible typist as well. I never well, think about how bad people were at typing back then. He, he had cool handwriting. Though. I did like his handwriting. But, you know, Hunter Davis, if you were going to be critical, you could say, oh, I may have cherry picked the best letters, but there's lots of letters in that book. You know, I don't know whether Hunter Davis did this or not, you know, but at least, you know, you've got the letters. They're in John Lennon's handwriting. They're clearly coming from him. At least it's something you can see, you know, unless someone did a wonderful forgery job, which I don't think they did. But, yeah, my my main point really is don't try and find the truth. You know, just try and find kernels of truth and see what rings true. And Fred Seaman's book mostly rings true. I, I feel like it falls apart a bit at the end, and you, you can tell me when you finish reading it. Like he has, uh, when they're in the studio making Double Fancy, something like Yoko's disturbing him, and he says, remember the River Kwai, you fuck, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> about, you know, the, the bridge on the River Kwai in Thailand that the soldiers built for the Japanese. That was pretty bizarre. But what you'll find in the Fred book, I don't want to spoil it for you, but basically there's a complete change in John Lennon from the, this sort of hermit in the Dakota to the songwriter, because, you know, they go to Bermuda and you know the story. We know that John Lennon didn't write all of Double Fancy in Bermuda, but I think he put the song right. together. So he was definitely inspired. And you'll, you'll yeah. love reading about what Fred says about that, that, like, this John Lennon that I'd read about is suddenly reborn after I spent this time with this sort of frustrated hermit in the Dakota. You know, I think Fred was a fan, though. I think, you know, mm. that's the scary thing whenever you read, not scary necessarily, but when you start reading books by fans is – you know, Fred has said a couple a couple things in the book. I can't think off the top of my head, but it kind of rings. This is a fan talking about someone they admire, and then it kind of gets clouded a little bit. And I guess it's the journalist in me. I mean, like you said earlier, with the whole you know clinical view, I look at all this stuff in a clinical view. These are people that were actually there experiencing it, and mm-hmm. so they obviously had a different outlook on it. Fred was but also he said major surgeon ship. Go. Oh no, you're fine. Yeah, I, I had heard that he was the. I actually learned that in your. Uh, podcasts mm. with Caitlin. And I agreed with your point in it. That is kind of strange right when he started working on the Dakota that he was already planning on writing a book. And as a journalist, I mean I wouldn't be thinking about that, honestly. Mm. That was one thing that kind of threw me off a little bit. And I believe you said that on the podcast that that's a little strange that that'd be his first instinct. Am I correct? Did you say that? Possibly, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I can't remember. <laughs> You're like, There's a lot of podcasts out there that I've done. I think Caitlin said she thought it was totally natural that he might be writing a book. And I think I said, you know, if I'd have been in his position, A, I would have been trying to spend as much time with John Lennon as possible because what emerges from that book is this incredible character who's had this incredible life already, even though he's only 39 at that point. And, you know, nowadays, if you had a smartphone, I think there'd be a temptation. I mean, you're a journalist. I have a kind of a journalistic sense, even though I've never worked. Yeah, I would, I would call you a journalist with this podcast. Right, right, yeah, fair enough, yeah. You feel like, you know, if you were going to have a conversation, you might have your smartphone on record, you know. Because- John would have been so paranoid in this day and age. He was always scared of people taking pictures and writing things. I mean, with a recording device, oh, he would have had security checking your phone. I mean, it would have, I could see him being a very paranoid person, but maybe he would have grown out of that. I mean, it's, I always wonder how he would have been if he, uh, this is going to sound bad, but I, I think he, if he would have been assassinated, I think he would have been sick enough to where something would have, you know, you know, George stopped smoking, but he still got cancer. I could see John still yeah. chain smoking something. Cause, and yeah. as someone with an addictive personality, I understand. I mean, you always have something you're addicted to. And mm. I think smoking would have definitely been something he would have just always been addicted to. I think smoking is such a self-medicating safety thing. I think that's my conclusion about smoking. I, I've never smoked before, so I don't know. But that's one thing I was thinking reading Fred Seaman's book is that they kind of talk about, oh, how he was sober during this period. But he was still smoking a lot of weed. He was smoking like a chimney in general. Mm-hmm. And then one thing I kind of picked up on is how much he, and this might be an English thing, you might understand it, but how much tea he drank. Doesn't tea kind of give you that euphoric, uppity feeling a little bit? Uh, yeah. Caffeine? I, I think he was drinking coffee as well. Coffee and tea. Yeah. You know, we all have a drug of choice. Ken Womack was just saying this. I've just been editing it, as I told you today. You know, Ken was saying that his drug of choice during the lockdown has been like ice cream, you know, which is basically sugar. So I think, again, I had a psychologist on. I was lucky to have a psychologist on last year. He said, you know, with all John Lennon's, the stuff that happened to him, his need for a drug was probably just a little bit more than the average. So, you know, he had coffee, he had tea. As you said, he was smoking a lot of weed. He had nicotine, tobacco. You know, he had all these sort of safety 
blankets, these defense things that we all have. You know, but then again, he might have gone down the Iggy Pop route and become like a, a health freak, you know, a fitness freak. You know, I mean, the last I heard, Iggy Pop was doing like, I don't know, 500 sit-ups a day or something crazy like that. Well, Ozzy Osbourne did the same thing. He went through a real big... I'm not sure if you ever watched the Osbournes. I'm not sure if that was aired over there. Yeah, he was a very big health freak. I kind of had, and this is controversial on my part, but I have kind of a weird outlook on drugs. And I think you might have mentioned this on the podcast, but there's a country, it's not England, but it's kind of near there, where they supply heroin addicts with needles. Um, it's like a safe place um, to do drugs. I think that might be in Scandinavia, isn't it? I'm not sure across the pond that's what i always say it's just across the pond somewhere <laughs> in, in those scandinavian countries the population is small enough that you know they can have prisons that truly rehabilitate you know i mean just try right. to do that in the states you know what i mean like oh yeah no <laughs> i mean it's just well my my thing is that in this there was a movie back in like the it was based in the 50s and it's these two detectives they're trying to find a heroin stash they're trying to you know crack down on a heroin problem mm. and uh one of the detectives says, uh, why can't they just uh, not do heroin? There's no reason they need to be doing heroin. And the other detective says, well, when you get home, you have scotch. Some people need something else. Some people don't drink scotch. So they'll take heroin. And that's extremely controversial. But I'm like, you know, it's like everyone needs something to unwind. I mean, it's not controversial, really, because um, in the 80s, we had, uh, you know, Nancy Reagan, who was the president's wife, saying, just say no. Uh -huh. And then we had the war on drugs, which has just been a complete disaster. It's completely the wrong approach. However, you know, again, if I was the American president, which <laughs> you know, I wouldn't really know exactly what to do or where to start. But um, there's a guy um, online that I listen to a lot called Gabor Mate. He used to work with addicts in uh, Vancouver. And he's written some amazing books. I mean, I, I, I've read one. I've flicked through other ones. And I've listened to tons and tons of his audio. He said that when people with severe issues of, you know, childhood abuse and everything. People had never been hugged in their life by their parents. When they did heroin, they said it was like a, a soft hug or a warm That's heartbreaking. Hug. You know, oh. it's, just, it's like you hear that and you just like, you want to just cry your eyes out. And then you understand, you know, imagine, uh, you know, how can you judge someone if you find out that someone who has never been hugged by their parents, like ever, right. all they have ever known in their life, you know, maybe their parents were meth addicts or heroin addicts. All they've known in their life is abuse. And they take this thing and they suddenly feel like they've been hugged. And I can completely, you know, I haven't had that abuse. I've been very lucky. However, I do have a mind and I read a lot, you know, and it's it really irritates me to hear like people judging heroin addicts without knowing anything about their lives. You know, and, you know, I, and I'll be honest on the podcast is that, mm. you know, I I don't have an opioid problem, but I'm on tramadol. And I tell people, I say, you know, I don't abuse it, but whenever I take it, you know, I have anxiety and depression. And I say, when I take it, it's like a veil gets lifted and I see life. I see this is the way the world works. Like it takes away all the anxiety and depression. Sure. Um, and so it kind of just makes me feel normal. And so I wonder if there's a point where it just makes heroin addicts are kind of in the same situation. And I think they, there are some, you know, that go crazy and start shooting in their jugular vein and all that. But I mean, I think, I wonder if some of them, you know, kind of like with John and Yoko, where they would snort the heroin, if there's just a little bit where they can kind of control how much they take. And I'm not condoning it. I'm, I'm genuinely not, but no, I'm not. You know, I do wonder if some people can take it. I heard that on Joe Rogan actually, is that there was a, a guy on there who was talking about how he worked uh, fishing crab. And mm. one of the guys on the boat had real bad pain and he would get off the boat and shoot up heroin and then get back on the boat and go fishing. And that was just his pain medication. Sure. And so it's, you know, it's not a cut and dry thing. And one, one book, if you're interested in this topic is called chasing the scream. I can't remember off the top of my head, mm. the author, but he's British. And uh, his theory on it is, have you heard of a study called rat park? No, I haven't. No. Back in the 70s, whenever they were studying addiction, they put a rat in a cage and had one water bottle with just water in it and the other water bottle with heroin or cocaine in it. And the rat would always go for the heroin and the cocaine and it would kill himself. And then they did Rat Park back in the 90s. And the theory was, okay, well, let's give the rats everything they want. You know, lots of rat friends to have sex with, lots of balls and toys and 
and wheels they can spin around and food and all kinds of cheese and put a heroin bottle in it and a bottle of water. And the study concluded that only 10% of them went for the heroin. I don't buy it though. I don't, I don't think people do these drugs just because they're lonely. You know, you look at John and Yoko, they had everything that they could want and they were still on heroin. I think it goes deeper. Yeah. Dan Rector was on the show. He, he said he felt that anyone, I asked him if anyone could be, could become addicted to heroin, even someone from a middle-class upbringing who had basically a happy family and no trauma. Although yeah, we all have trauma relatively no trauma and he said yeah they, they could be and if you take uh, have you ever seen requiem for a dream no i haven't i've, I've heard of it but i haven't seen I mean, it no i mean it's phenomenal filmmaking but again i don't want to spoil it because <laughs> i'd like you to watch it but essentially it's about um four people and it's three young friends who are into heroin but they're kind of managing it in their lives and one of his one of the friends mother who's played by ellen burstyn amazing performance she's a a housewife or she's a widow she's dreaming about being on tv and it's because she sort of says later oh, oh they'll love me when i'm on tv so she wants the love of you know it could be that uh, people do podcasts maybe i maybe one of my reasons for doing this podcast is because i get love from my listeners you know we've got to be honest right anyway um she wants to lose weight to go on tv so her doctor prescribes her amphetamines and of course at the beginning it's great you know she's got more energy she loses weight so she starts taking more and more and she gets hopelessly addicted. And I won't tell you anymore because I don't want to spoil it, but it's about how people take different drugs. And it's absolutely, you know, you watch Reprium for a Dream or Train Spotting or something like that. And, you know, it's a good advert for not becoming a heroin addict. However, the Requiem for a Dream is really showing that people, she's a, a respectable and a housewife or a middle-aged, respectable middle -aged right. woman. And she finds her drug because later on in the film, she says, oh, you know, this is all I've got, basically. Because she, she gets a letter saying that she might be on TV. She's on, like, probably a very long shortlist. And she's clinging to that dream. So that's a very interesting film. But go back to my point, you know, I think the key thing is not to be judgmental because, you know, if you've got a, like, nice sort of cosy middle-class life, you cannot identify with a person who's never been hugged. That doesn't mean that there aren't middle class people who have abusive right. children. It's absolutely not. But more than likely, you know, someone someone who's grown up in a housing estate with addicted parents, you know, you can't possibly identify with them. So don't make judgments is is all I'd say really. And sometimes those people will take it, you know, just kind of enhance the experience of life. I mean, if you think about uh do they call them pubs on England or do they call them bars as well? Yeah, we have both really. But the old fashioned ones are pubs, yeah. Right. Well, I mean, you go there and hang out with friends or go party or whatever you may. I, I'm not a club person, but whatever they do in a club, I mean, you know, you get people socializing and eating and having fun with each other. But there's also cocaine and Molly and, uh, you know, alcohol, obviously. So, I mean, it's just I think some of this is just to enhance it. You know, I was saying about that because my therapist actually <laughs> was the one that told me about Rat Park and was saying, you know, the reason you take drugs is because you're missing a connection. Mm -hmm. and whenever I read a book and I'm not taking my drug of choice, sometimes it doesn't seem as enjoyable. It's like, I'd rather just take the drug of choice and enjoy the book a little bit more as well. Yeah. And so but I think the problem is, is when you cannot function, when you, nothing is fun anymore. Like you can't even go for a walk in the park and that's not fun. I think on one of the shows, I think it was one of the Elvis shows that went out sort of December, January, I was saying there's a point where if you're in control of your life, you can take a drug and you get the positive benefits. Like it gives you a bit more energy and you feel a bit more positive, but you've got enough handle on your life that the low isn't too bad. Like, you know, the come down might be just like half a day or something. And then you feel all right again. But there's a, there's a point where if you're really conscious of what's happening, you realize that instead of working the drug around your life, you're now working your life around the drug. And, you know, when I was in Thailand, I, I, someone gave me something. And I took it. I didn't realize at the time, but it was basically the Thai version of meth with caffeine added to it. And I can't describe how incredible I felt while I was on it. But thank God, I think it was two days before I left, weirdly enough. But, you know, if I hadn't been leaving, you know, who knows what could have happened? You know, could have easily. Oh, yeah, you could have been hooked on it. Completely, yeah. And, you know, I come from a relatively stable background. You know, I've always had my own kind of issues, but I, I realize how lucky I am totally realized that and 
Paul McCartney to take an example, even though his mother died, it's obviously a very traumatic thing. He said, you know, he had a very stable family, but he said, you know, in, in the drug show, we mentioned this in that, and it was in that writing so high book, he tried heroin and thankfully for him, he didn't like it. He just didn't like the feeling. Had it got another way, you know, he could have been a heroin addict. You know? well, it's, it's funny with, with drugs though. And I, I related to Paul McCartney heavily with that because after my dad passed away, mm. um, I went through a real bad, severe depression and, it sounds so um, cliche, but I had a friend come over. And he's like, well, hey, I have something that'll make you feel better. Yeah. And he's like, you know, he's like, you can't tell anyone about that. And I'm thinking, okay, well, what is it? Like, mm-hmm. is it weed? And it was a, a bag of Coke. Right. And, um, so he's like, well, just try a line. And I mean, I'm, I'm in a state where I'm just not all there. So I tried the line, but I had just gone over a cold. And so it didn't do anything. And so whenever I read about Paul, I was like, okay, I understand your feeling. Because, I mean, I'm afraid if I would have taken that, I would have liked it maybe. Yeah. But it didn't, it didn't have an effect on me. And so luckily that's not something that I'm into. I do take a supplement, though, from Thailand. You might have heard of it. Kratom. Right. It's a natural opiate. Right. And kind of like the Philippines, Thailand, like that whole area. And it's uh, supposedly not addictive. I'm not going to say I'm not going to promote it. But it is interesting. I mean, there are some drugs out there that can be beneficial. It's how how the people take them. And and you know, whenever you're talking about Paul, I was I was talking about Paul as well. He definitely was the most stable of all the Beatles. But everyone has just a different background. I mean, you know, you look at Ringo. Ringo became a full blown alcoholic. Oh yeah. But he, but he had a. I think I believe his family was close. It, it was his family or George's family. One of the families been very close. But I think Ringo was pretty close with his family, though. So Ringo's father left, but he happened to have a very nice stepfather. Yeah. It was a Cockney, weird enough. George had the most stable upbringing. You know, all the others either lost a parent through death or, or through divorce. And George, I don't believe he really got addicted. I mean, was it cocaine that he was on for just a little bit? In the 70s, there were kind of two Georges. Uh, one minute, he'd be spiritual, vegetarian, a bit like John, really. And then, then you'd have party George. There were sort of two Georges going on. But I think he got very into LSD. I think him and John. George is a funny thing. I would think I would be more interested in George. But, I mean, John's my favorite Beatle, and that's been the one I've been attracted mm-hmm. to most of learning about. But George actually spent a lot of time here in Tulsa, where I live. Leon Russell, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. He yeah, yeah, sure. lived and was from and lived in Tulsa. And so George would come out here a lot. But I was just at the grocery store about a year ago. And the lady there, her boyfriend was Eric Clapton's bass player. And she hung out with George and Patty a lot. I, I think I like it, John, because he's just a very complex person. You know, he would openly contradict himself. I mean, he, uh, Elliot Mintz, even though I have my own opinions of him, you know, he interviewed him during the last weekend and was asking, you know, would you ever reconsider getting back with the Beatles? And mm-hmm. John was saying, you know, if, you know, I'm, I'm feeling good right now and, you know, I, you know, the wounds are healed and it's all fond memories. Yeah. I mean, if, if they wanted to, I would, I would do it. Well, then Elliot asked him the same question two years later. It was right after Sean was born. They did a radio special and John openly said, oh, yes, I said that whenever I was feeling good about life. Yeah, I don't really feel that way anymore. <laughs> and so, I mean, he was very open of, hey, I'm human. I'm going to contradict myself. It's going to happen. It gets a bit excessive at times. So <laughs> having done this podcast, it just, sometimes it's a bit like, well, yeah, I wish he was a bit more consistent. But I think this period, yeah, the 75 to 80 period is just, I feel like I'm always apologizing to the listeners because I'm always talking about it. But I think I like mysteries, you know, I've always been into true crime and, uh, and I mean, I, I'm not talking about the crime that killed John Lennon, but right. crime has that mystery sense about it. Like you want to, you sift through the, I mean, obviously you being a journalist is a similar thing. You sift through the evidence and you try and deduce whatever you can. And that's the thing. I mean, I'm, I'm really into that period as well. So I understand that. I mean, I, I like the mystery of it. Yeah. So leaving aside, you know, the murder, I'm talking about, his state of mind up to December 1980. And it's just this wonderful mystery. And, you know, meeting Caitlin recently, she's given me a few more nuggets. And with drugs, just one more thing I wanted to say, I'm very, very careful about sounding like I'm endorsing or advocating things. Personally, I go with the Joe Rogan thing that I don't think weed is going to cause major problems. But then, of course, people will in a way, there's always evidence of everything. You know, there's always one case of almost everything you can imagine. 
And so I'm sure there are people who've smoked a lot. Obviously, paranoia is the thing that it creates, and that could get quite severe. You know, there's a singer I really like called Nick Drake. I don't know if you ever come across him. He died in the 70s when he was 26, and he apparently smoked unbelievable amounts of marijuana. So maybe uh-huh. I think there was something already there with him that that would have, you know, could well have triggered things. So I, I've said before, I think I'm just neutral. But then, you know, you watch Requiem for a Dream and you think, how could I possibly ever say that I'm neutral about it? But that's, you know, that that's giving you that viewpoint. I don't think heroin is good for anyone, honestly. I just think there's a there's a difference, like. No, and I don't. I don't think it's good. But you know, for me, I look at every single drug you can take has a bad effect. And I, um, when I tried weed, I almost had a full blown mental breakdown on, and I couldn't function on it. My doctor thinks I'm allergic to it, so I might be one of the only people that are allergic to THC. But uh, you know, every drug has you know has a danger to it, and that's just the truth. I guess I kind of take more of a libertarian view of it. You know, I don't think an adult should be able to tell another adult, you can't do this because I know better. Well, of course, you've got to remember that, you know, street drugs are all cut with, you know, on one of the shows, I think I, I included a clip from a, a festival and they were talking about what was in the drugs. And, and one of the ecstasy pills didn't have any ecstasy. It was like something else. Well, I mean, John and Yoko were getting baby powder there for a little bit. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Clearly, the issue is about making it safe as well. You know, again. I'm not saying heroin's good for anyone at all, but, uh, you know, until we know, you know, what the clean version of the drug is, you know, essentially you're dealing with street drugs. It could be anything, you know. I, I definitely don't recommend ever doing that now. <laughs> no, exactly. But, you know, through LSD or through, let's say, mushrooms, which is the more organic version because LSD is synthetic, you know, you can have, um, you know, if you've heard of Terence McKenna or Bill Hicks, you know, they, they made good points about that. And again, uh, you know, I, I I have to stay neutral, particularly since I have a podcast that quite a few people listen to. So, you know, I just say, I definitely say, as I said earlier, with the heroin addicts who, like I say, have been subject to huge abuse and never been hugged, you know, you can't possibly judge them. Because if that offers them this hug that they've been craving all their life, perhaps the society should look into what happens in these Scandinavian countries we were talking about earlier. I know it's easier because there's not that many people, but of controlling it and trying to have a, a humane uh, attitude to it. And more so look deeper at, you know, I mean, John said it, I think on Dick Cavett, we need to figure out why people are hurting so much that they can't deal with the regular life without having to have some kind of substance. And that could be alcohol, cigarettes, whatever it may be, coffee, even, you know, why, why we can't live life with, without any of that. Yeah. And I mean, a book I read years ago called out of it, it was a really good book about intoxication. People have been changing their consciousness since we arrived on the earth you know right exactly and that thing about john lennon you're absolutely right i mean that was 1971 why didn't anyone pick up on that you know i never hear anyone say that anymore it's this thing you're always treating everything's always treated very superficially you know he's an addict let's treat that he's an alcoholic make sure he doesn't have any alcohol yeah you know i wouldn't give alcohol to alcoholic but under very controlled conditions you know they do give small doses of heroin and try and wean people off it you know that's a humane thing to do. But our society right. treats everything superficially, you know. And I don't know whether that's going to change. I'd like to think it would, but maybe I'm doing my very, very small part on Glass Onion. Who knows? Hey, maybe. I think one area that, that would be interesting is mm-hmm. talking about, I just noticed the anniversary. Today is the anniversary of the Ed Sullivan Show. I think 56 years or something. Oh, uh, right, yeah. Something along those lines. And I uh, started reading Larry Kane's book on it actually this morning uh have you read ticket to ride yet no it's on the list i hope i'll get Uh, there's all there's i know there's too many books that that you can read yeah it's pretty good and it's uh it's just kind of crazy thinking of how much the adults in america really did dislike the beatles it's kind of the equivalent of you know how adults now think of you know harry styles and uh you know justin bieber back in the i don't know who's famous now i don't know who like the main pop person is today (laughs) But it's it's interesting how the dads back then really, really thought the Beatles were like this, this big menace to society. Yeah, I think there's a bit of a parallel with Nirvana, actually, because when Kurt Cobain died and the Nirvana Unplugged came out, I think everybody suddenly realized that they could actually write songs and they weren't just noise. Because when it came out, I think young people loved it, but nobody took the songwriting seriously. And that's what happened with the Beatles as well. No one realized they were using these really fancy chords and stuff. I mean, Nirvana weren't, but the Beatles were. 
Right. So, yeah, with Nirvana, that Unplugged really showed people, oh, these are really good songs, because when you strip them down, they work, you know. And embarrassingly, I've never listened to a Nirvana song. Oh, really? <laughs> and it was just crazy, because everyone always talks about how Kurt Cobain was John Lennon of the 90s. I don't like screaming music. I hated Mother. And, like, you know, I just, I don't like songs where they grab and scream in it. And every single Nirvana song is just a, just screaming from what I've seen. There was one, I think he was covering, uh, he didn't publish it. It was just a demo recording. I loved it. It was really good. Probably And I Love Her, is it? Maybe. But it was just him, like, just recording at home or something. And I, I thought, man, you have such a beautiful voice. I always say, you know, I, I was born in the generation where, you know, yeah, I was born in 97, so I guess that was during grunge. But I I never followed my uh, my generation's music. I was raised, like I said, on, on the 60s. And so <laughs> I have the knee-jerk reaction to say, yeah, it's it's my my generation. But yeah, Larry Larry Kane's book, I, I recommend. I, I don't know. I, I, I find that tour very interesting, the, six, the 64 and 65. But you know, I kind of feel bad because, you know, I, I feel like American fans kind of just look at, you know, the Beatles American tour mm. and they kind of overlook, you know, what happened in England. Cause I mean, there was, you know, and you can read Mark Lewis's book. I mean, there was so much going on in England years before then, but Americans kind of like myself, we kind of just look at, okay, 64 and after. Yeah. Well, eight days a week was a bit like that, wasn't it? It didn't really cover Hamburg at all. It's a weird film. It was more like the Beatles in America. I think that's what the point was, wasn't it? I mean, that's what I always yeah, it was called The Touring Years, but then he, it, was a, it was a weird documentary because then they started having a, a, a graphic for every time there was an album and telling you how many weeks it was at number one and stuff. The British albums, that was what was weird about that film. It seemed to be the American tours and then they'd tell you about the British albums. <laughs> Does that kind of upset you as like, you know, someone from England? It doesn't upset me. It's just, I don't know, it's just like an incomplete story, that's all. I don't know, I just, I, racism is a pretty big issue right now and and there's the, the whole thing about Americans thinking, you know, we do the thing, the right thing and everything, you know, it's kind of about, you know, the American perspective. Yeah. But I feel like, you know, I always look at the English as like the siblings or as the, the cousins or something. I don't really consider the English separate that much. Does that make sense? It's like I never hear of there being that much of a difference between the two countries in that aspect. I try to word it correctly because it makes sense in my head. I suppose culturally they're quite similar, yeah. Yeah, so that's what I'm trying to say. It's like, you know, with other countries, it's like, you know, we'll say if it was something from Japan or another country, we would mm. take it and kind of make it our own. Yeah. But, you know, with, with England, I mean, it's, I, I've never seen that happen before. Except with the Beatles, I mean, they, they took American songs and made it their own, which is hilarious. Because, I mean, I grew up thinking Twist and Shout and, and a few of those others were actual original Beatles songs. <laughs> Long Cal Sally, I thought that was a Beatles song for the longest time. Those Beatles covers are quite stomping, not like punk music, but punk attitude. Yeah. The original is a bit more danceable, perhaps. Right. So have you seen any of the Beatles live? I mean, I, I guess you're old enough to where you were to be able to see all of them. <laughs> well, not John Lennon, but... Uh, right, yeah. I saw Paul McCartney yeah, at Wembley, oh God, ages ago, 1989, perhaps. Maybe it was earlier, because I wasn't... I remember I wasn't actually a, a particular Beatles fan then. It was just on the cusp. And I saw him, uh, it was good, yeah, it was really good. I really liked that 80s band he had. The guys they've got now is great. They're great, obviously, but I think they had Hamish and they had Robbie McIntosh, who was from The Pretenders. Uh, Ringo, I don't really have any interest, to be honest. And George didn't really tour much anyway. So, yeah, just Paul. It's funny, it's funny you say that about Ringo, because um, Ringo is my least favorite Beatle. I mean, no offense to Ringo. But I, uh, he's the only Beatle I've actually seen in concert. He came to Tulsa three years ago, mm. and that was honestly the best concert I've ever been to. And I've been to quite a few, but that was... But also, he has that all-star band, and so he has a lot of pretty famous people with him. I mean, it's not just nobodies. I mean, um, mm. 10CC, the guy from 10CC was there, one of the guys from Toto. I never remember their names. I just remember what bands they were part of. But they would start playing, you know, songs like Africa and... Uh, I'm not in love and like all these different songs. I'm like, Oh, so I was coming here thinking I was just going to be here and yell at submarine. <laughs> oh, really? There was a bit more. Uh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he left the stage and there was about an hour where it's other, other bands. Cause I mean, he has this all-star band. So it's all these people with competing egos. And so he, uh, 
he leaves the stage and I want to say he leaves for like an hour and it's all these other bands playing their hits like men at work the uh lead singer for for that band was there and so he played uh down under mm. and so they're playing you know some pretty recognizable songs and then Ringo obviously comes back and will play his songs and, and I was so surprised and how well he sings still because he did a yellow submarine and it sounded just like the album my phones they actually started I have a setting on there if music is playing it alerts me to the song and it was alerting me to revolvers yellow submarine yeah. and I thought that was so cool because I mean I was like okay so that, it sounds close enough to where even the technology is picking up on it yeah did he do stuff like Don't Pass Me By and Octopus's Garden and all that? Really? I don't remember Octopus's Garden. I feel like he did Don't Pass Me By. I mean, it, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, this is a few years ago, but I mean, it wouldn't surprise me if he did all of those because he didn't really have that many Ringo songs. Mm. And I mean, in, in the time span he had for a concert, it makes sense just to fill it. I remember there was a few songs on there I hadn't really heard before, like... um. I really didn't listen to the solo Beatle albums. I mean, the only one I really listened to solo was uh, John. Even Paul, there's a lot out I haven't listened to yet. The the song he opened up with is uh, It Don't Come Easy, which was really good. I discovered that one from there. But uh, yeah, honestly, I, I don't really have much interest in seeing Paul now. I would like to see Paul years ago. I stopped going to live gigs probably in my 30s, actually. Really? Why, why was that? I don't know. I mean, I never went to loads. I used to go to festivals. So I went to Glastonbury Festival three or four times, probably the three or four best times ever. So I'd kind of cheat by going to festivals, which is like going to 20 gigs in, in at once. I don't know. I like recordings, really, a bit like John Lennon in that sense. He never went to see people live, but he, he preferred the recording. I think I do as well. I've had some great times, but it was sort of a once or twice a year thing. I'd go to a couple of festivals in the summer. And that would be like my fix of uh, live music. I get that. Here in Oklahoma, there's not too many uh, festivals like that, sadly, unless it's country and western, which I can't stand. I mean, I saw America and, and a few other concerts, mm. but then the pandemic hit and all the concerts got canceled. <laughs> you know, like I said, I love all these older bands. And it's, it's disappointing, you know, for myself going to see them because they don't sound anything like they used to. I mean, you can get lucky with some, but like, with Ringo, I mean, he sounded good. I mean, he sounded really good. But uh, you'll see bands like, you know, America or like the Moody Blues or, or things like that. And they have uh, younger backup singers who are really just singing the songs and, and the, the band members are just kind of there. Yeah, what they often do is they actually get someone, um, I've heard of this behind the scenes, who's uh, uh, sort of covering the melody. So they're actually singing the song along with the lead singer. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, like not in harmony, but in unison. They almost do an impression of the lead singer. So it sounds like just the lead singer. It sounds like he's sort of like some reverb on his mic or he's double tracked or something. It happens a lot to cover the lead singer if he's really old and hasn't quite got the pipes anymore. Well, I feel like it's, it's more so of a, uh, John had that quote, you know, people weren't coming, you know, for the music, they're coming for the circus act. They're coming for the Beatles. And I feel like that's, true i mean i don't really go to these concerts to hear the music sometimes i just go to be able to say yeah i saw america in person or i saw ringo star in person i just want to be like yep i've been in the same room as a beetle I, did you I, get you know, close or you along the way? oh yeah i was i was close I'll, I'll send you a picture he, I mean, he was very active i mean he was i mean i was very close i mean i was literally um at the very end i was probably in the second row at the very end they're doing uh give peace a chance or all you need is love or, or one of those and it was you know come up to the stage and i was right up on the stage i had my arms resting on the stage and he walked right by me i was like oh my god i'm like that's a beetle it might not be john lennon but i mean it's 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 a beetle there's actually a, a group of beetle fans out there that only consider the actual beetles to be the one with pete best i didn't think that would actually be a real thing but there are real beetle fans out there that only consider the authentic beetles to be the beetles with pete best be really interesting to hear a recording because the only stuff we've got with him is the is Decker and obviously that recording of Love Me Do at Abbey Road, which it wasn't really his fault, I don't think. But it'd be nice to hear stuff from sixty one or something, but there's really nothing at all. And have you reached out to him? No, I mean my friend Owen interviewed him. And I just feel like he's gonna just say the same stuff really. I'd much rather just talk to slightly less famous people who have got good stories, you know. No, that's hey, that's the best way to do it. Is you get those little tiny niche 
stories. Yeah, my favorite podcast you've done so far was the very last one. Okay, oh, forget the guys. Yeah, I, that guy is so fascinating. Yeah, we got into, not surprisingly, we got into my favorite topic. Yeah, we said we weren't going to do any more in 1980s, didn't we? But suffice it to say that um, he found a good middle ground, I think. I think I said it on the intro to the episode. I don't buy that version totally, but he was saying, like, as you heard, he was saying, you know, in private, I think about I think about it a lot. But he didn't want to really speculate in his book. So, you know, you can only go with the interviews you do and what people tell you. That's why he quoted Fred Seaman a lot, because he, he said, we don't have anyone else. You know, <laughs> we don't have any other witnesses who are willing to talk about it. And I think it's funny, like, I really, in, even on forums or anything online you were the first person that's actually as fascinated with that period as i am just i and i like crime i which it's not a crime story but i like you know kind of going behind the scenes and figuring stuff out oh, me too yeah. um love true crime. And so that's extremely interesting to me that the fairy tale of it is oh you know he got his life together and everything was wonderful and he had mm. this album going number one and then he got taken away it's like yeah that sounds good but it's like it was nowhere near the truth one bit I cut out, Ken mentioned our Double Fancy one album of the year. But, you know, I hate to be cynical, but you can't say that John Lennon's death didn't have a fairly big part to play in. Yeah. I don't think that would have been album of the year otherwise. I don't know. Possibly, but... I, think... I don't I don't see it. And, and I'm not trying to be cynical either. Yeah, I had three number ones in England immediately. Yeah, I don't know. It's a funny thing, isn't it? You could be really cynical and say that it's something to do with the way that it's marketed. Because... I've never quite understood this need to start buying someone's albums after they die. Is it a tribute? Is it because you think that they're going to run out? Or I'm being very clinical about it. I know I know there's a lot of emotion involved, of course, but I've never quite understood that because Elvis Presley made more money in the year after he died than the rest of his career up to that point. I think. Yeah, I, I want to know like the science of it. There's a shirt my uh, girlfriend got me. It says, uh, "I'll only care about you after you're dead." Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's so true. And you're gonna edit out this part because I'm not sure if you want to add politics to this. But you know, obviously, no one in America like Trump. But now that he's out of office, now I'm sort of like want to read books and kind of learn more about that presidency. It's the weirdest thing. It's like after someone's dead or after something's over, then I had the fascination to like get into it. I don't know why. That's just kind of always how I am. And I know, like with Paul, I didn't really listen to his album, didn't really care, like the latest album he had. But I know the second he dies, I'm going to listen to all of it. It's the weirdest psychology thing, and I really want to find out the reason behind it. I think one reason could be, with Trump, for example, it could be that when something's over, you can assess it. You're not in the middle of all the all the propaganda and all the hoopla that comes from him and from everyone else. You know, it's not just his propaganda, but the anti-Trump propaganda. It's just propaganda is really <laughs> is really the thing that I think drives the world. You know, the, my new podcast, if you don't mind me plugging it slightly, Life and yeah. Life Only, that's what that's going to be looking at because I've been, as we're recording this now in February, I put three episodes out which have been more about inner truth. My podcast is about inner truth and outer truth, so it's going to try and find a bridge between life coaching and psychology on the inner side and then alternative media on the outer side. So I'm going to have a couple of guys on soon. We're going to look at propaganda and we're going to look at how people receive media and stuff because it's fascinating. So, yeah, I think, I think one of the things is that, yeah, you, you have a chance after someone's gone or either out of office or, the, or if they die to reassess their career with a bit of objectivity. But then there's an emotional component as well. I think it's a way of paying tribute. Even though, you know, I've never really... How do I put this? When Paul dies, which I think will be, won't be for a long time. You know, I think he's, he seems in pretty good nick at the moment. I think I'll feel sad just that he's not around. But I won't mourn him as if I knew him. I think there's, there's a thing that happens. I mean, if you take someone from your country, JFK, I've never really heard a sober assessment of JFK's presidency. No. So coloured by what happened, you know. That there's some conflict. Some people say that he was trying to pull the troops out of Vietnam. But someone like Noam Chomsky said that wasn't the case at all. What I'm saying is that the manner of his death still reverberates, and that's been 57 and a bit years. Yeah, 58, yeah. Yeah, 58 this year. But he died in November, so yeah, 57 and a bit. Yeah. And of course, with John Lennon, it's just the manner of the death. 
it makes it very difficult to, for anyone to talk about him without that emotion creeping in, whether they knew him or not. It's a weird thing. I, uh, I went to New York City on my 18th birthday a few years ago. And then the first place I went to was the Dakota. And, uh, of course, as a young amateur Beatles fan, I started playing woman. And I, like, looking through the Iron Gates and, like, knowing he got shot there, I already have kind of a morbid sense about me. I'm weird about stuff like that. Mm. And so I, I remember kind of starting to cry. And it's a weird thing. It's like I never, I never met him. There was nothing there, really. But uh, it's just it's strange, the psychology of it. I mean, the same thing happening whenever I uh, drove down to Dallas and went to where Kennedy got shot. I've, I've been down there a few times just because my family's from there. And, you know, every time I go through Dealey Plaza, you know, I always get very emotional. But you're right. There's no clear-cut view of his presidency. And one thing I, I love, and this isn't a spoiler just because it's years and years old, Stephen King wrote a book, 112263, and there was an alternate history of what would have happened if, you know, about stopping the assassination of Kennedy with time travel. Right. And uh, when he doesn't die, the whole world pretty much falls apart. There's a nuclear war caused by and, you know, all the stuff. It's like, you know, the, the point of it was is we don't know if he would have been a great president four years after that. I mean, we, we say he would have been. We always say, oh, yeah, if Kennedy would have lived, Vietnam would have happened, this would have happened, you know, which, which you, just, you just don't know. You, you don't know. Well, um, so then you have another argument about could the president stop a war anyway? I mean, a lot of people would say no, right, yeah. not at all, because it's a lot of the time it's capitalists that start those wars and, or, or either propagate them. You know, it's that Ken Burns series that came out a few years ago. I won't talk about it now, but I've... My boy should do it's very good on Vietnam. It's very good, but it's very. Um, I mean, he doesn't mention the CIA or the Phoenix program. It's probably a, this probably is a tangent we shouldn't go on. But <laughs> it was a very educated, you know, cut and dry kind of thing. It wasn't the behind behind the scenes that much. So there was a whole thing called the Phoenix program, and the CIA were massively involved in that war. And Ken Burns didn't mention it at all. I mean, it was very good. It was good footage. It was, it was good on the history. But with JFK, I think, and with John Lennon, the thing you got to remember as well that they suffered a violent death. Regardless of who they are, JFK was shot, you know, shot in the neck and then he was, his head was blown off, you know, hate to be graphic, but you can see it. And we had it with Princess Diana a bit, you know, regardless of whether you, you like her or not, she still died in a horrific way. I mean, that car... I was just about to ask you about her, yeah. I was, I was, no. I was crushed into a cube, you know, it was horrendous. But, again, I don't sound too cynical, I don't think with John Lennon or, or JFK, it's not, it's not all propaganda because... I think with musicians, there is undoubtedly something that comes through in the music. And you do feel connected. I think you can feel connected with someone you've never met. It's just when people take it to extremes and like, I don't know if anyone killed themselves after John Lennon was killed. Perhaps they didn't. Perhaps it was um, someone else. I can't remember. I could see a girl or a boy or something calling a radio station saying, I'm going to kill myself. And then they took that as, okay, we're going to record that as a suicide because of John. But, you know, yeah, I, I, feel like... I don't know if there's any confirmed, though. I had a guy on who was at the Dakota, went to the Dakota on the night, and he said people weren't really hysterical. People were just a bit sad. And there was that inevitable, we've talked about this, that inevitable kind of electricity in the air that you can't deny, you know, doesn't make right, it. Yeah, there's always going to be that excitement, which is wrong and morbid, but I mean, it's just, you know, it was a big event. It's wrong, but you can't quite say it's wrong because it's natural. It just happens. The guy who was, when it was on the show said um, they were quite calm. I mean, they were just... It was a, a tinge of sadness. Well, more than a tinge, probably. But they were playing the music as well. I think they were focused on singing along with the music because he said there were loads of boom boxes and stuff. And I feel like I just listened to it. Was it uh, Fred Seaman's friend, the, the, yeah. the one that wrote the book? Robert Rosen, yeah. And, and going back real quick, because I want to ask about this. So go ahead and plug your, your other podcast. Where, where can uh, people listen to this? Yeah, Life and Life Only. It's in all the usual places. And uh, the Twitter is at lifeonly 75 and I'm just getting started, but it's a podcast about life, as I said, so <laughs> it's uh, endless scope, but it's focusing on those areas, really, life coaching, psychology, and alternative media. So anywhere you can listen to Glass Onion, you can listen to this. Yeah, pretty much. And for the moment, I'm posting all the links on the Glass Onion pages anyway, because I may as well make the most of the audience I've already got. And you already have episodes out, you said? You're about two or three, I believe? Yeah, about three in, but when this audio we're doing now comes out, probably be a lot more i've got lots of essays or blog posts i wrote years ago that i could just use as episodes and i've got conversations i recorded with other people to use so there you go yeah 
Well, you mentioned something I've, I was kind of curious about. I've been watching The Crown. I've mm. gotten really into that show. I'm not sure how the British people feel about that. I've never <laughs> seen it. I know it's popular, but I've never seen any of it. Yeah, the Americans, we, uh, we watch that and think it's history lessons, which it's not, apparently. Don't fall into that trap. But it's a very, very good show. But it kind of makes me curious because, you know, like, like you said with Lady Diana, you know, she had just that horrific crash. But I know she got really famous afterwards. But was, was she still in the spotlight before she died? Because I know that she and Charles had divorced or something. I mean, I'm, I don't know a lot about the situation, but was she still in the spotlight as much as she used to be? Or was yeah. it how she died that made it a big deal? No, no, she was in the spotlight. Generally in the tabloids, though, you know, the, the gossip uh, newspapers, The Sun and The Daily Mirror and maybe the highbrow ones as well, I can't remember. But, I mean, I say, quote, unquote, hounded. I think you know probably better than I do. That I think the whole celebrity world of that, you know, the celebrity has an agent. And as far as I recognize, a lot of this stuff is organized. Right. It's going to be in a certain place. So I don't buy that she was completely hounded. But I think maybe they went a bit over the top, perhaps. She was also campaigning against landmines. She was something of a controversial figure. She was going out with a Muslim as well. Some people would say the royal family were perturbed because there were reports that she was pregnant. But if she wasn't pregnant, it was felt that she probably they probably would have a baby at some point. Although she wasn't really in the royal family. That's what I don't, don't really understand when I look back on it. She divorced. Were they actually divorced? Didn't they got like a full-on yeah. divorce? I think so, yeah. Pretty sure. But she'd gone on a show called Panorama, which is a sort of investigative program, and she said, oh, there were three people in our marriage because I think the woman that Charles ended up marrying, Camilla, Camilla. Yeah. I think he was with her originally in the 70s and maybe was, but, you know, Princess Diana had plenty of affairs as well, I think. Yeah, but she went on Panorama and she said, oh, there's three people in this marriage. And, you know, it's not an accident that she goes on this TV show and says that. It's obviously been arranged. So I think she was something of an embarrassment to the royal family. So she was in the news, yeah. But it was mostly, you know, she'd just be snapped by paparazzi and appear in tabloids. Oh, you know, this is Diana and Dodie on a boat, you know. But yeah, she, the, the royal family is very fascinating. Like, um, <laughs> do they hold as much power today as they used to have? I mean, I, just, I don't feel like people discuss them as much. Depends whether you mean officially or allegedly, you know. it's um, Officially, they don't. I mean, the prime minister has to go through a ritual of technically the queen has to accept a new prime minister. So Boris Johnson you know, has to get down on one knee and ask the Queen's permission to form a government. And, I mean, the Queen, unbelievably now, I think is 94. I think she's 95 this year, which is quite amazing. I think she still does ambassadorial. She probably doesn't anymore, but other members of the royal family do. I'm not sure if the Queen drinks uh, blood. That may be why she's survived so well. Right. So, <laughs> allegedly. No, allegedly. I think, what I'm saying is that I think... Um, some people do believe that, you know, maybe they have a bit more power than they make out, but officially it's an ambassadorial, really, and very symbolic. Obviously, you know, it's not cynical to say that a lot of the tourist revenue comes from the royal family, but I always contend that if the royal family was abolished, people would pay just as much money to go to Buckingham Palace and look at the house that they used to live in, you know? <laughs> exactly, yeah. It's exactly what we're talking about. You know, everyone buys Elvis's records or John Lennon's records or Kurt Cobain's records. You know, if the royal family was abolished, and I don't have a huge, I don't have a dog in the fight, as they say, I don't have a huge opinion, they would suddenly get this cachet, you know, like everyone would suddenly want to know more about the royal family. And they'd, I reckon the numbers of people visiting Buckingham Palace would go up. If oh, yeah. Got rid of them, you know? But uh, that, that's a debate that goes around. But I think if you ask the average person, it's, apathy is probably the thing they feel the most about the royals. How do we get onto that? No, that's interesting. No, I mean, you can edit all that up. I just genuinely enjoy talking with you. You're, we have a very similar interest in things. So I just enjoy doing this. Well, um, with this true crime thing, I've always been interested in true crime. And, you know, you do wonder, you know, is it voyeuristic? Is there something, is there something about that? I've never been afraid of really dark topics. Like there've been some really dark films made over the years. I find it fascinating to look at the dark sides of human nature. That's why I'm interested in Mark Chapman. Like most other podcasts, they just will not even mention his name and they, they don't do programs about him, which I completely understand. That's fine. I don't know. It's just an instinct. You know, I don't believe Oswald killed Kennedy, but mm. if we want to believe the official story, he was wanting attention. 
I mean, he wanted to do something great, and we talked about Oswald, so I mean, we might as well talk about, you know, Chapman. I think because this thing came out that he did it to become famous, and again, that's that's quite a simple explanation. Something I always come back to is that we're all given this very simplified version, and I still say the majority of people just run with that, you know, because it's just, it's easy, and, you know, I, I just... I get into conspiracies a lot, but the whole John Lennon assassination, I just, I fully believe the official version i just listened to your podcast with the the conspiracy of of the murder and i just mm. i don't know i don't i don't buy into the conspiracy of that one not because of your podcast i mean i'd heard it for years john was away from the spotlight long enough and he just he wasn't a figure to really have assassinated in my opinion yeah the timing of it was weird because um someone like martin luther king uh, I, I think the two most suspect ones actually i mean i think martin luther king i mean they've they even found that you know they even did a report that didn't really get much play in the media that, that found that there was a conspiracy i think that one is extremely suspect but jfk mlk and rfk were all cut down in more or less their prime robert kennedy in particular because he just won the california primary you know and he exactly just made a speech saying you know we're on the way and blah 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 and then he's killed you know, seconds later. But John Lennon, yeah, I don't think there's a huge amount of evidence to say that he would have been involved. What we do know, I don't know if you know this, but he was due to go out on a march two or three days after he died for uh, Japanese-American workers. And I think one of Yoko's cousins was involved, but they were going to bring Sean with them. And I always say, if they were going to get back into full-time activism, they wouldn't bring their five-year-old kid with them. Right. Yeah, maybe they would, but I don't feel like they would. So... But that, that is interesting, don't you think, that, that he was due to go out on a march? You know, that's not really known by most people. That is interesting, but I just, um, I don't know. I um, I asked my dad this, you know, he was a baby boomer, and I asked him, so, you know, do you, what do you remember of, you know, the anti-war stuff? And he didn't remember John. I mean, there was a lot of people that were alive back then that, you know, John wasn't as big of a presence in the anti-war stuff as, you know, history will tell us. And so, I mean, we can look back, but I mean, the average person back then doesn't remember the bad end. I mean, those, that came out in songs and, and documentaries and, and stuff like that. But unless you're actually looking for it, you're not, I don't believe people were seeing it back then. Yeah. And I just, I don't think he was a big enough presence to be taken out. I think there were a lot of different people out there that could have been taken out rather than him. Yeah, I mean, I definitely wasn't yet convinced when we did that show. I mean, we both agreed it was a lot of circumstantial. So, yeah, I just think there's a, it's a possibility. And it's the problem with history, going back to what you're saying about how important he was, the problem with history is being constantly revised. Right. You know, and the fellow I did the Elvis shows with recently, he just said to me recently that he thinks maybe, you know, that was overblown John Lennon's importance. I mean, who the hell knows? It's, it's fascinating, but it's so difficult to commit yourself to saying, I, I think this is definitely true or definitely not, you know? Uh, it's all about, you know, what happened at the time. People become more famous after they die. And, you know, that's just something that I think will always happen. But I, I always want to talk to people that were alive during, you know, I, I remember seeing my dad's wedding picture in 76 and thinking John Lennon was alive. Like that blew my mind because all the photos I have are like, you know, from the eighties or the nineties. And so I was looking at this picture. I was like, John Lennon was alive. I was like, that's crazy. Yeah. He was like secluded in the Dakota, but he was alive. And um, I'm asking, I was like, did you guys think about the Beatles or anything? Like, you know, was that like a constant thing? He's like, nope. I mean, we had the Eagles coming out and, you know, Earth, Wind and Fire and all these other bands. So I just, you know, I, I was just wondering, okay, what, what was the Beatles significance? Were they just another band? I mean, were they just a band that broke up, you know, a few years ago or, you know what what was that like because i feel like they blew up again after john died but then since the 90s you know they, they're just they're a constant now i think maybe with the internet for sure after the you know the internet and uh the anthology blew it up again didn't it yeah but the funny thing about the anthology i don't know about that in america but in britain the viewing figures went down like you wouldn't believe after about the third program one of the problems is that they scheduled them at some crazy time i think one of them went out on new year's eve at 11 p.m or something <laughs> maybe i got that wrong but nothing is real did uh, you know that podcast they did some good programs on the anthology really good nothing is real and try that fabcast one for something alternative but um i'm gonna have to wrap up in a second break but yeah i just saw the time i was about to say do you need to wrap this up yeah just to say that um 
Yeah, with the internet and the fact that, you know, so many people would have, for example, YouTube open most days or even for most of the day, their videos are going to pop up in the feed. You know, they're, they're just going to be ever present really forever. And I don't know where the millennials are into them. I just did a podcast with my niece for my film podcast. We did the social network and uh, I didn't ask her about the Beatles because it wasn't really part of the, com- of the conversation, but she got to know them through Glee, if you know Glee. Oh, God, yes. yeah. I mean, How old is she? I mean, she's 23 now, but when she was into oh, Glee. Oh, she's my age. Okay, uh, yeah. But when she was into Glee, I, I, I guess she must have been 13, 14, 15. I can't no, remember. I remember that, yeah. But we bonded because then she knew all the 60s songs because Glee had covered them all. That's so, so funny. And I think John Lennon's voice, partly speaking voice, partly singing voice, is, is going to be there whether you like it or not, you know. But that's true of other people as well. I know David Bowie, for example. Funny that that's how she got into it, though. Because I remember vividly when Glee had, they had a Beatles special. Yeah. But um, it, it was just such a cringy, cringy thing. But if that's how it gets people into them, I mean, all, all power to them. Yeah, it doesn't matter how it happens. Because I better let you go. I know you said you're kind of wrapped for time. You have a class or something coming up. I just don't want to get in a tangent and distract you. All right. Well, you do a wrap up because you were in charge of this. So I think we covered everything. I think we did pretty well here. Mm-hmm. Kind of straight and talked about conspiracy. I like it. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what I said. That's what I like about this whole format is it's a lot of just, it's just a conversation. But going deep as well, you know, because chat is one thing, but you know, when you go deep and you try and analyze stuff, that's what I'm into. That's what my new podcast is really. I mean, it's, it's getting worse and worse at small talk as I get older, you know, edit this far around but do you think i did okay analyzing things that's one thing i've always struggled with is analyzing things i enjoy it but i feel like i kind of go on different tangents Mm. about it and you've got the instinct which is great and you're 23 so you've got years and years and years to cultivate it yeah i kind of have john's perspective where i'm gonna die young so we'll we'll see what happens well (laughs) maybe by 30 i'll be gone that's a morbid way to win i used to think that as well actually i think i got a bit hung up on that you know when I was 23, I was probably, I don't know, had this ridiculous thing about, I don't know, am I going to be in the 27 Club? But I, that wasn't based on any evidence. The funny thing is I thought the 27 Club whenever I was like 18. But the closer I get to the 27 Club, I'm like, eh, no, 40. When you look, look at the way all those guys died, there's nothing glamorous about it. That's the thing. It's, if you're into true crime, it's worth, you could de-glamorize it by looking at, you know, I'm sure you've done this, but investigating some of these crimes and premature deaths and stuff. And it's just... Horrendous. I actually just read that Hendrix was murdered, really. That it wasn't an accident. It was a, um, they think he might have been murdered. I mean, <laughs> even with Janice Joplin, I mean, they could have, you know, secretly given her some bad heroin on purpose. Yeah, I mean, it's anything could almost be anything, really. Now you, you've got this alternative media that I was kind of involved with for a few years, but then there's always people who are going to take it further and further. Say, oh, Michael Jackson, Whitney Houston, then find reasons why. Whitney Houston had some terrible secret about the music industry she was going to reveal. Oh, well, there's always some big secret that's going to come out and then they die. That's just... Yeah. yeah, it's difficult to investigate all of them. So I try and focus maybe on stuff which is fairly provable and things like propaganda. I mean, that's a big thing with me is trying to show people that... There's a book actually called Your Opinions Are Not Your Own. And it sounds very patronizing and very... It's the kind of thing that people would have an allergic reaction to. And they're like, what are you talking about? My thoughts are not my own, but... If you think about it, we are all propagandized and you've got to be big and admit that, really. That's one of the things that's difficult for people to do, you know. You got to go research things on your own. Well, Anthony, we will definitely stay in contact. <laughs> you have my email. And make me semi-famous. And hey, maybe your podcast will make me semi-famous. We don't know. Any, yeah. Anything can happen. Yeah, editing takes care of a multitude of sins, so it'll be fine. <laughs> there you go. Right. Well, Anthony, you take care, all right? All right, you too. Bye. Bye. So there you have it, another episode of Glass Onion on John Lennon is in the books, in the bag, in the can. You can choose your idiom. I've been doing a lot of teaching recently, so idioms are on my mind. I also did a recording, actually, for the Luke's English podcast, which is another recommendation, particularly for non-native speakers, because Luke is an English teacher, and sometimes he breaks up the topic of the show with some discussion of words and phrases and whatnot. But it's also fine for native speakers as well, because some of the episodes are just regular podcast episodes on interesting topics. So there's another podcast to add to your list. The next show is actually going out, I think, the day after this one or two days after. I'm just 
sneaking it out before the end of the month. And it's an appearance I made in the Classic Film Jerks podcast, which is a comedic look at old films, with uh, analysis as well, of course. I did post it originally, I think it went out in February, but uh, if you didn't hear it then, then that'll be a treat for you. We discussed the Hard Day's Night film, and uh, yeah, that was lots of fun. Anyway, I'll talk about that a bit more in the next episode. So I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you very soon. All the best, take care, and goodbye.